Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our sixth session of Atlanta Forging Forward webinar series. I'm Deborah Ryan, Atlanta Managing Director for Changing Our World, a global impact, social impact consulting firm that's a part of the Diversified Agency Services Group of Omnicom, which makes us the only philanthropy consulting firm that's part of a Fortune 200 company. Previous to going to joining Changing Our World, I worked for 20 plus years in Atlanta nonprofits, foundations, and consulting communities. Atlanta Forging Forward is building off of the success of our firm's National Forging Forward series, which was launched um, right at the beginning of the pandemic as a way for us to learn from experts and professional peers, to learn what they were um, how they were forging forward during the uncertain times. We hosted a national forging forward focused on Atlanta and realized that we wanted to give an opportunity for philanthropic, nonprofit, and social impact leaders in our community to talk about the issues that we're facing our Atlanta community and talk about how we could have impact and make changes. Today, I'm really excited about our conversation. We're going to be looking at a year later into COVID, how is Atlanta recovering and how can we best help Atlanta entrepreneurs um, with the impacts that they faced over the COVID-19 pandemic? I want to introduce our panelists who the, we're so excited to have here today. Our first panelist is Latresa McLaughlin Ryan. She is the Executive Director of Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, an intermediary organization leveraging ideas, people, and capital to close the racial wealth gap in Atlanta. Prior to joining AWBI, Latresa was the Vice President within the Foundations and Endowment Specialty Practice at SunTrust Bank. She has more than 15 years of experience as a strategic advisor, helping entrepreneurs, nonprofit, and foundation clients maximize the impact of their assets. Prior to joining SunTrust in 2014, Latresa was the Director of Office of Partnerships and Global Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Development at Operation Hope where she focused on cultivating strategic partnerships and led the fundraising and development activities across the organization. Latresa began her career as an attorney in Washington, D.C. She is an active local leader where she proudly supports various community efforts, including as a board member and former chair of the Grove Park Foundation, member of the Georgia Plan Giving Council, and as a member of the United Way of Greater Atlanta Community Engagement Council. She earned her BS in computer science from Spelman College and is a graduate of the University of North Carolina School of Law. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank you. Our second panelist is Grace Fricks. She is the founder and CEO of Access to Capital for Entrepreneurs a Georgia nonprofit organization that helps business owners grow their businesses through capital, coaching, and connections. In 2018, Bank of America and SunTrust Foundation honored ACE for outstanding impact, providing more than 60 million in loans, assisting more than 900 small businesses, and helping create or retain 7,700 jobs for Georgians. Grace was named as one of the 100 most influential Georgians by Georgia Trends Magazine. She was honored with the Vision of Excellence Award by the Atlanta Business League and presented with the inaugural Lifetime Achievement Award by Startup Atlanta. SBA Georgia named Grace as the Financial Services Champion of the Year 2014. Grace currently serves on the advisory board uh, for Atlanta Women's Entrepreneur Initiative the Board of Directors for Appalachian Community Capital, the Board of Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, and Invest Atlanta's New Market Tax Credit Board. Grace is a small business owner for more than 15 years, and she's a former board member of the National Association of Women Business Owners Atlanta Chapter. 
her undergraduate degrees in social work from the University of Tennessee at Martin and her MBA is from the University of Memphis. And Grace, we're so excited to have you here as well. Thank you for joining us. So first, I just wanna make sure if our listeners have any questions, you can use the chat function. And if, if we have time, we'll share those and have them a part of the discussion, but we'll also share them with the panelists after the session so that they can follow up. And we just appreciate everyone being here today and we we'll wanna go ahead and get started. So both of your organizations are doing phenomenal work to provide capital and resources to support those businesses and business owners who often face challenges um, and inequity in funding. Can we just start with both of you giving um, an overview uh, of the organization, of your organizations? And Grace, if you want to start. Sure. Um, we like to say that we give people a chance when others won't. And we started as a nonprofit loan fund. And I, I guess you could say I'm kind of a social entrepreneur. I've always had a little knack for starting things, but also um, I have keen interest in mission and in social impact. And so we are a loan fund that exclusively focuses on small business. Um, we have been certified as a community development financial institution, or a CDFI. And I mention that because um, we'll talk more about it during this, but they're becoming more at, at play right now. And CDFIs either do um, affordable housing, um, facilities development, like sheltering arms, job, large child care programs, or they do small businesses, and we are the ones that do small businesses in Georgia. Wonderful, thank you. Latresa? Sure, thank you, and thanks for having me today. So, uh, Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative is a community built, data driven, intermediary nonprofit organization, and we focus on closing the racial wealth gap at a systems level through community wealth building strategies. Uh, we do so by leveraging national and international best practices and bold ideas. And we share that information and those bold ideas really broadly throughout the ecosystem, but specifically with our community practice, which is about 45 nonprofit government, quasi-government, and philanthropic organizations that keep our work grounded in, in the community's needs. And I'm proud to say that in addition to Grace being a board member, ACE is also a part of our community of practice. Um, we also focus on addressing the systemic barriers to access to capital um, through nonprofit capacity building grants and grants for innovative prototypes to nonprofits, as well as uh, flexible grants and loans to businesses, uh, as well as helping funders and capital providers maximize the impact of their dollars and in some cases um, reimagine how they deploy capital to the community, uh, all with the goal to increase share prosperity throughout Atlanta. Wonderful. Both organizations are doing such great work. I want to go ahead and get started with you, Latrice. And we're getting a little feedback. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna turn down my volume. There we go. So first question. We're, we're a year into the pandemic and we're just starting the economic recovery. And I wanted to ask you about your work, Latresa, um, and what it looks like today, considering that pre-pandemic, Atlanta was the number one city for income inequality before the pandemic. So with, with all that's happened, how, how has that impacted your work, which was already a, a huge endeavor? Sure. So, um, you know, the, the pandemic really highlighted the disparities that we were already focused on. Uh, so it didn't necessarily require a pivot in our work, but more so a acceleration of our work. Um, the If there was any type of, of benefit from the pandemic, it was that the the fact that these disparities existed um, was no longer in question. So we, we thought that initially our work would be on focusing and bringing awareness to disparities, but that became very impaired. Unfortunately, at kind of the worst 
time in our history um, to exacerbate those disparities. And so our work uh, now is, is again, focusing on what we've always focused on, um, the really creating an environment where um, we're a data-driven organization and the data has led us to focus on the disparities of, of the Black community first, because the greatest disparities exist there. So uh, going forward, the work is just really focused on how do we create um, an environment where Black people can thrive in the city and we can address our economic mobility issues and, and our income um, inequality issues. Uh, we do that by uh, really one thing we've, we've launched recently, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later, is our Advancing Enterprise Prosperity 1,000 Black Businesses in 1,000 Days. And that work is centered on um, providing infrastructure and pathways to, to Black-owned businesses to increase uh, revenue, but also to uh, be able to increase their uh, official employees uh, and, and pay them a living wage. 96% uh, of Black-owned businesses in Atlanta are sole proprietorships, but uh, a large percentage of those businesses have a, a number of 1099 employees. Um, and that this difference, even though they might be making you know hundreds of thousands in, in revenue, uh, when PPP became available, for example, they couldn't apply for all those jobs uh, that they were securing because they were 1099 employees. So really helping businesses create infrastructure, but also in other ways in creating, um, expanding social networks, um, expanding our community of funders and capital providers, um, assessment of risk, and, and set, making sure that's really grounded in reality of what has been the Black experience and the ability to access capital, both um, through lack of generational wealth, but also impediments in, in various systems to access wealth among other things. So that's, we really are focused on uh, recovery and understanding because the data shows us for a lot of businesses, for example, it will take uh, three to five years for them to recover. Uh, the Federal Reserve recently reported that uh, the black community recovered from the last recession just 18 months ago. So mm -hmm. the pandemic came right at the heels of that. And now a lot of families are starting over again. So our work is, on you know holding space for that i know everybody wants to get back to normal and you know <laughs> do what they've been doing but we this is a new normal and we have to approach it um, differently and this is our opportunity to do it more equitably because uh the the old normal never was inclusive for everyone so our work is is on um, recovery and then sustaining that growth and that stability within our community that's perfect to your point it's um getting your message out might have been a, uh, about the inequity might have been a silver lining to the um, the pandemic because people there's no disputing that anymore as far as um, what the pandemic really uncovered um, one of the things you that, know, that Sarah, go, go ahead yeah if I can pop in go um, right ahead I, I, I unlike Latrice I, I am not an attorney. So, um, you know, she and I always talk about um, she's so eloquent and I'm just just a southern southerner that cares about these kind of issues. And you can tell by my right. accent. But one of the reasons that the work that Latrice is doing and that Ace is doing is focusing on entrepreneurs right now. And the reason that's so important is the data shows that white families are 13 times, 13 times wealthier than black families. But when you compare a white entrepreneur to a black entrepreneur, that drops to a factor of three. Wow. So that means that as a strategy for wealth building, it is very worthwhile to help people own businesses and grow those businesses and build legacy wealth. And so I just wanted to throw that in. And, you know, as far as the PPPs, exactly what Latrice said about the sole proprietors was true in the first round of PPPs. Now in the second round, um, sole proprietors 
and 1099 contractors were eligible. And so our organization as a CDFI was able to participate in the PPP program and it's still open right now. So as of right now, this year, mostly with sole proprietors, we've done 233 loans for wow. 5.9 million. And the smallest loan we've made is $600. Wow. And you can see when you start dealing in those smaller numbers that for large banks or banks at all, it's not profitable. Right. And, and so that's why CDFIs exist, because our mission is not to be profit maximizing. What was your biggest loan if your smallest was 600? I'm going to take a, a stab at it and say it was about 200,000. Perfect. Yeah. Well, Grace, um, one of the things when you talk about the, the entrepreneurs and helping that as a strategy in wealth building, what do you think now where we sit? What should entrepreneurs be planning um, as we look forward and as we, we look, what are the important resources that they need in order to, to move to a sustainable, you know, especially when it's three to five years potentially for um, to fully embrace and have this economic re recovery? What would be your advice to an entrepreneur? Um, one of the things that we knew after doing lending for 20 years is that um, most of the time, it's not the business owner's skill or trade or service or product. It is cash flow and the management of cash, which will sink the small business. Because unfortunately, you can be sucking out the cash and your profit and not even realize it until it's too low. So one of the things that we've seen in, with the PPP also is in order to apply for the PPP, you have to have your financial statements that show some um, loss during COVID. And you've got, you've got to have the documentation. And many businesses, many small businesses are ju just do not have that acumen. And so I think that the, I would say that's just reinforced that the most important thing a small business owner can do is understand their financials. And accountants can do it. Small business development centers. I mean, there's a, and we do it. I mean, we have Women's Business Center in Norcross, and then we have one in Savannah that does education. And, but I would say that's the most in, important thing is to understand your money. Uh, the second thing, of course, <laughs> you gotta have customers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, that's kind of a common sense thing. So the resources are gonna be where you can get capital. And for underserved populations, frequently that's going to be something more like a CDFI. Um, and Latresa does, or AWBI, um, does sort of like best practice work. And, you know, when she was talking about um, bringing in innovative ideas, one of the things that is very helpful to all of us is that they test some of those ideas and, and introduce others to those ideas. And so then we're able to take, you know, after they say, this will work, this will help a small business, then we're able to take it and try to scale it. Ah. And I'll be glad to give you an example if you want. Please um, do. I mean, one of the things that um, AW by, AWBI introduced was something called integrated capital or blended capital. And so that would be, you will take grants mm -hmm. or what we call non-dilutive <laughs> capital, same thing. Um, but we take grants and layer that because that's an equity piece without ownership. You don't, the, the CDFI or the nonprofit doesn't take the ownership, but puts in a grant and then puts debt capital on top of that. So that, that full package is more affordable and recognizes that 
the businesses have had have not had customers for a significant period of time, and so so they're very far behind. Yeah. So AWBI introduced that, did some things with it, and then we were able, because we have like 25 staff now, we were able to take those ideas and work them with Wells Fargo. And so this year we introduced a product and Wells Fargo was able to fund it at, a, at three and a half million dollars, which is wow. gonna leverage another 10 million. So we're gonna do 10 million this year and we are doing in the process of doing them now, where um, if the borrower is approved, they pay the payment for the first six months. Mm -hmm. During that six months, they are using our educational resources and we're helping them with the coaching. Remember Capital Coaching Connection? The connection. We're helping yeah. with, with the coaching and helping their business to get stronger. And then after the first six months, the next nine months, the payments are forgiven. Wow. Yes. So, so you're bringing in a, a business that's that's pivoted and that shows that it can pay your the the first six months. The next nine, they don't owe any payments. It's paid for them um, by the grant. And so that's like a, a runway or a launch pad for for them to be successful. So that's just one of the examples of things that that come from being with a thought leader because the thought leaders are pushing the envelope and helping you look at risk in different ways and look at opportunity and they try some things and then help us to to grow it and if i could jump in there i think for us um i know for us it it's just as important to know what works as what doesn't work in the community and because our work is really grounded in community we can then uh, test those prototypes, fund them, and say that so that when a new partner comes to town or um, a new initiative uh, is developed, we can say, we tried that two years ago, it's not gonna work, let's do this instead, which we find to be incredibly helpful in addition to uh -huh. those prototypes that do work as, as Grace described. Right, well, it must make you happy to hear, Latrice, that is something you piloted has is going to have such an impact in our community. Absolutely, and I'm I'm proud to say that we we have a few examples of that. Um, and it's really uh, you know our role is to to take on that initial risk and also demonstrate that um, risk profiles can be adjusted and still create successful programs um, that are worthy of of greater funding. And so um, we we are proud to serve that role here in the community. Well, both of you have um, teed up the next question perfectly. Um, one of the things that's, that we've talked about in, in a couple of our webinars before has been the barriers that um, entrepreneurs or social impact organizations or even Black-led organizations, the barriers that they face when they um, seek funding. And, and in many cases, they may be smaller or, or less well known to the funding community. So therefore that, that turns into being a, a riskier investment. And just wanted to um, ask both of you, if you've seen instances of this and you know what, what can the community do to remove these barriers or, or even change the perception of these, these smaller um, organizations um, so that they can get the funding that they need to, to have impact in the community? So, so first of all, I think it's important to be, um, it's critical to be proximate. You cannot really evaluate how risky an organization is if you don't really know that organization or the community that it serves. And um, either you do that directly through your company, organization, or foundation, or you partner with organizations that are approximate, that can tell you the ins and outs, but not only tell you the ins and outs, but also can um, partner with that organization to so they can grow their capacity and better serve the community, particularly organizations, regardless of their size, that have proven to be impactful um, and proven to, to, to serve their community well but perhaps have not been able to scale. And to that point, um, that directly ties into the you know, cyclical nature of, of funding. 
um, a small organization, well, I'll, I'll put it this way, um, funders have a tendency to fund the better known organization. The better known organization can become better known because they can get more funding. Um, they appear to be more established because they can get the funding and it just becomes a cycle. So until we create um, an alternative to that, that really deepens the relationship with organizations that are doing good work because um, they're more than those that are just well-funded that, that are doing great work and often, particularly if you're addressing a social ill or addressing a disparity um, in the community, especially in the black community, really relying on those leaders um, that are, are in community, black led organizations that are speaking to and directly just from their lived experience can mm -hmm. share what is actually needed and um, deepening the relationship to um, ensure that you're solving for the root cause of the issue versus a program that might you might have perceived to be helpful or might be like something that's happened someplace else that we don't know to be true to be impactful on the ground. Um, and it's important to listen to to our, our particular nonprofit organizations. We fund nonprofits and um, and businesses, but but nonprofits for sure. And it's important to lean on their guidance and understanding and years of expertise that they've developed um, in the market to determine really what is a risky proposition, really, you know, determine what is going to be impactful instead of relying on measurements that someone created that may or may not ultimately address the root cause uh, and, and provide a root solution to the issues. Because if we don't do that collectively, uh, particularly in philanthropy, we'll just be funding the same program <laughs> Have solved the same surface issues and we will never get deep enough to really eliminate the issue. That's awesome. We had a social entrepreneur on a, a previous show who said that they become social entrepreneurs because they want to work themselves out of business. They want to solve a problem that they see in the community as a part of their lived experience. And so um, that tracks exactly with what you're saying. Grace, what do you think about the the risk or that are funding those unknowns or smaller organizations that that you're in the business of funding those who might not get capital from other places? Well, I mean, I was one. I mean, <laughs> you know, A started with a $50,000 grant um, from a federal funding source and I have, am a social worker. I mean, I have an MBA, but that was in, you know, I did well in management and marketing. And accounting and finance was a little on the right <laughs> side. But with $50,000, I thought, you know, can't get in that much trouble. Uh, and the loans mm -hmm. were only $5,000. And, you know, I did not. I mean, I did it because I wanted to see something better for the community and to help small businesses who did not have family or friends or other resources that could help them. And that was in July of 2000. Now, I didn't quit my day job until 2003. And by that time, the, you know, the fun, the fun had grown and I'd become intensely interested in it. So, and today we've done a hundred million dollars worth of loans. But it, I mean, back then, I mean, even on our board of directors, um, it, I know that refreshment is, is the key to keep having new board members. But we have one of our founding board members, the founding treasurer, who's still on the board. And one of the reasons is because um, three women, along with me, took a chance when I said, let's do this because I can make this work and I want the opportunity. And they took the financial and fiduciary responsibility as the board. So, I mean, I feel like that you have to, I mean, the risk is that you're, you're not going to have the assets, the resources, the, the, 
the very things that make our country and our communities great if we don't take what's perceived as risk and give people with ideas and also determination a chance. Okay. Economic opportunity. And whether that's a small business or whether that's a nonprofit, everyone deserves that chance. And what is the, you know, the risk is that we don't have great things around us. We don't have we don't have wonderful community restaurants that we can walk into or coffee shops or nonprofits like um, Village Micro Fund and and um, Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative. I mean that's the greater risk is that we have a reduced quality of life. Mm. And and I'll add to that that um, just from a, a business perspective, it's. Well, first of all, when, when you are in relationship or a partner or approximate to the issue, it allows you, or to the organization, it allows you to extend not just your financial capital, but your social capital on behalf of the organization and that cause to help that, that organization grow, which is also incredibly important, um, even if you're just sharing the message that they're trying to move forward. And from a business perspective, it's the same is true, introducing them to extending your networks or introducing them to networks so their businesses can grow. And to give you an example, um, just because we focus on kind of a continuum of support, but also collaborating and really partnering with the broader ecosystem to, to make that so. Example is a company called Brown Toy Box, um, who I happen to know the, the founder, Terry Michelle, because uh, she's also housed at, at the Russell Center for Innovation and, and entrepreneurship where both ACE and AWBI have offices. Um, and her, her office is there as well. But then fast forward, you know, several months, a year through the pandemic, um, she was at the, you know, not necessarily the beginning stages, but had established her business with the school area school systems to provide her, her African-American themed steam boxes to school systems. Well, of course, with the pandemic, the schools closed, there was no need for right. steam boxes. That was her market dried up all overnight, essentially. Wow. So um, connecting her to technical assistance to figure out how to pivot, but also capital um, was critical in those early days. Our, our COVID-19 Small Business Relief Survey showed that 68% of respondents um, could not go more than six to eight, excuse me, more than two to three weeks without revenue um, wow. and survive. So we didn't have months or weeks to um, wait on, on federal funding or other funding sources, really needing to get that capital out as soon as possible. And at the time, and for some months after that, unfortunately, we were the only ones that she could get capital from just based on you know, her, her profile. Um, historically, um, you know, it, it's, just, it's known that historically, a lot of black owned businesses have trouble accessing capital. Um, or friends and family capital to early stages to um, start their businesses because the access to generational wealth is different among other reasons. Anyway, um, so she, so we gave her a first round, a first grant and loan, um, a grant cycle and loan cycle that she participated in, and that was last April and July. Fast forward to this February, um, her, and that allowed her to kind of get over that initial rough patch. Fast forward this February, her steam boxes are going to be in targets all over the country. Wow. And there's no way she would have survived to get, she, she stopped me at the Russell Center one day and said, you know, can you believe it? And you all were the first to give me money. And I, when I could not get it anywhere else and had that not happened, there's no way they would have survived to be able to take advantage of that opportunity, which also kind of came from a network member extending wow. their social network to, to introduce her to Target. So we cannot underestimate or overestimate how important it is to really be in relationship to understand the value of a business or organization to figure out where you can step in in your own way and for the initial dollars based on her revenue at the time um, we ultimately gave her ten thousand dollars but that allowed her to survive long enough to grow to now have this wonderful national opportunity with a with a major retailer so we can all do our part um, to, to reassess risk and, and fill in gaps where needed. It makes me think of um, when I was a director of development and you could get that 
if you could get that one institutional funder to invest in you, we would call it the, the good housekeeping seal because the rest of the funding community would know, well, if they're gonna if they're gonna invest here, we should give it a second chance or we should think about funding as well. So it it's interesting that the um having a more holistic approach is what's necessary, not just the capital, but but all of the pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, Latrice, you talked about earlier in the opening about the um, a thousand black owned, investing in a thousand black owned businesses in a thousand days. Can you share a little bit more about that with us? Sure. So um, I mentioned, you know, 96 percent of black owned businesses are, in Atlanta are, are technically sole proprietorships. So the goal is um, really our work is focused on a scalable uh, growth stage and established businesses and we support nonprofits that focus on early stage startup businesses as well. Um, but the goal of the campaign is to really provide resources and support and opportunity for businesses that I consider kind of the miss being the miss missing middle. They're beyond an accelerator incubator stage, but not quite at the point where they have their banker's mobile phone number, right? Or, <laughs> you know, they might meet with their CPA twice a year, but the CPA is not proactively reaching out to them to, you know, share updates and opportunities. And so um, often in this group, um, particularly for Black-owned businesses, but for all businesses, um, they don't necessarily have um, access to or could afford access to expertise to really give them one-on-one -on -one coaching to um, or in some circles would be an entrepreneur in residence, right, uh, to get them to that next stage of growth. And they might not know another business like theirs, period, much less one that has scaled. So, or may not know an entrepreneur at all. <laughs> so they're trying to figure it out all on their own, um, but they're at a stage where they, they need some some one-on-one -on -one, um, dedicated support to get to the next stage. So for 1,000 black businesses, it's, you know, three portions of it or, or, or three portions to the approach. One, focusing on growth and scale through procurement um, and not just uh, general procurement, excuse me, not just supplier diversity, but through general procurement, helping anchor institutions like in our case, Emory is our, our prototype partner with their nine colleges and 11 healthcare centers, really thinking through how do we um, reimagine the procurement process and policies that are in place so that Black-owned businesses can take advantage of the overall spend of the organization, um, that social networks are extended so that they know that RFPs are available, but also that those RFPs are extended to the broader community. Um, and then looking at, you know, things such as, is that the same assurance level needed for all our mm -hmm. contracting opportunities, or can that be adjusted depending on the level of risk that is, you're, you're taking off of the, the engagement that you're contracting for? But on the other side, ensuring that the businesses are ready for those opportunities. So surrounding them with back office support, technical assistance, access to capital through partners like ACE, um, but also the technical exp uh, expertise um, we fund coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching to meet the businesses where they are, to help them figure out what they need versus kind of a general curriculum, which can, again, can be helpful at those early stages. But once you have identified your market, somebody wants what you're selling. Now you need to get from 500,000 to 2 million. How do you uh -huh. do, right? Um, and, and also providing a, a, a procurement consultant to, that will provide help with winning bids. And in some cases, uh, facilitating JV relationships to go after bigger opportunities. Um, other components of the program or campaign centered around workforce at the neighborhood level, connecting neighborhood residents to neighborhood jobs. Um, and our work focuses on, on Atlanta, but also on Southeast, South, particularly Southeast, Southwest and Northwest Atlanta, where 80% of the population are black residents. So what would it mean to live in, and we know from data, that the large majority of expenses within um, that community is on automobile maintenance because often they have to leave the community to go to other parts of the city or the region for a job um, or, or, or a better paying job. So what would it mean to stay where they are? It would, would um, pour into the local community and local economy, but also help with, with some of those household expenses. And then finally, focusing on anti-displacement uh, and retention. 
um, the cost of, of a physical location in Atlanta for commercial space, just like with housing, increases, um, particularly in, in, in communities that are vulnerable to market forces, uh, exponentially. So we want legacy businesses to be able to age in place, and we also want um, growing businesses to be able to grow in place. Um, and often businesses are forced to leave the area because they can't afford a, a bigger place in, in their current neighborhood, and the neighborhood ultimately um, suffers. Um, mm -hmm. And another component of it is I'm a former estate planning and asset protection attorney. So um, I know the importance of business succession planning and estate planning to preserve that generational wealth um, and preserve that business during times of transition, re regardless of what type of exit it is, um, to preserve that business for the community and for that family. Um, and so we will help facilitate um, estate planning and business succession planning for businesses as well. So they're prepared to start thinking about what is it going to be their exit strategy? Um, how are yeah. they going to um, you know, pass on their businesses if they want to or sell their businesses? And often for our main street businesses, they don't think about that because so much in the market is focused on tech businesses and their exits. And, you know, it means 10 times whatever. Um, there's a lot of wealth that's been generated in, in communities and in strong communities and businesses have been developed because that planning has taken place to figure out how, to, how does this business remain in this community long term, regardless of who owns it or who is at the helm for leading it. That's awesome. And I know one organization that's, that's helping entrepreneurs think about their retirement, which is not always something that's a, uh, that's a priority for them, but, but thinking through so that they can have a, a plan to your point of um, next generation. Grace, did I, I may have cut you off. You look like you're about to say something. What I was going to say is, is, you know, when, when we talk about foraging forward after the pandemic, one of the things that all of us are doing in the, the eco system is we are working together mm -hmm. to, to really identify what each other's core competencies are and how we can share resources, talents. I mean, just like everything that Latrice just talked about, that whole area of retirement and state planning. I mean, our organization doesn't do anything on that, nothing. So, you know, our core competence is in finance. And then mm -hmm. helping organizations, you know, with figure out what kind of capital is going to work best for them and helping them to manage their money. And this program where she's talking about where she's talking about the um, Emory and the opportunities to, to actually help people get business. Um, there's a third leg to it, too. I mean, there's the capital. There, there's AWBI's piece, but then there's also the Morehouse's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center that's a partner with the three of us. And they are providing the management education in a cohort model. Oh. And, and yes, and so people apply, um, and, and it's, it's men, it's women, and um, it's also uh, so, and I mention that because you think of Morehouse is typically for, you know, African-American male. So, the, but this institute is for, for both. And, and so we are at the table working together to keep creating these programs that are going to provide the capital, the coaching and connections. No one organization can do it all and do it all well. Right. And, well, and you don't want to have in the same way we tell nonprofits, we don't want you to duplicate services. We want you to be, you know, we want you to, to your point, Grace, bring your core competencies and create those partnerships so that you can work together. Yeah. And, and that's at the core of what AWBI, again, we were community designed. So the community said, well, we need an organization to uplift work that's already happening here, make sure that we're not working in silos, but also share that that good work broadly, in addition to bringing in new ideas and new ways that, that we can do the work. And so we partner with, with existing work happening. We are here to fill gaps. If, if someone else is already doing it, then our role is to amplify, amplify that work. 
um, and in some cases encouraged to think, you know, a new way and, and expand it um, to, to more innovative ways to do it um, and to be bold about it and disruptive in some cases. And, and then to, if that we don't have what we need here, um, they said they want an organization to really be an umbrella organization, look at the ecosystem, figure out what the gaps are. If we don't have a way to, to fill those gaps here, then we'll fill them in the meantime while we're building capacity among organizations to um, step in and, and take on that role. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Grace. Our organization doesn't just sure. doesn't serve. I mean, we're not, I mean, for those of you listening, you may think, well, isn't there some overlap here? There's a little tiny bit, but really not much because our organization serves 68 counties so not you know we're not it just focused on atlanta which atlanta in itself is is the economic engine for our mm -hmm. host state and so it, it is important that 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 culture and the business part is preserved and expanded to everyone because it does have ripple effects into mm -hmm. the other metro counties as well as into the rural counties well, Grace, you ACE celebrated its 20th anniversary last yes. year. Congratulations. But yeah, and not much of a celebration during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I would say to your point where, you know, the, the first 50,000 to what was it last year? You said you raised over 18 million um, and including uh, a, a a very special five million dollar gift from the from the philanthropist Mackenzie Scott who who funded ACE. I just wanted to ask, you know, as things are are happening and, and we're hoping for an equitable recovery that that really embraces everyone, what would you say looking back, what are what are the differences, if there are any, in, in the entrepreneurs or their their businesses that you've seen and and um just to share some of your thoughts uh, looking back over the the 20 years that now includes a pandemic <laughs> um i think that the businesses are a lot more savvy today oh. than, than they used to be yes i mean a lot more techno i mean technology savvy what um, how, how you reach them it comes from is, is totally different. Um, I, I think the other thing is that CDFIs themselves, I mean, there are only a thousand organizations that are like our organization in the country. Wow. And the southeastern part of the United States does not have as many as, as the rest of the country. And there's lots of reasons that might be. Um, but this is a time that is, if you will, a watershed moment. Because the federal stimulus type packages that are coming down are in the billions for wow. community development financial institutions like us and alike, like our sister organizations that do affordable housing and do other kinds of facility and healthy food financing. So when you've got that kind of capital that's coming, we need to get it right. Mm -hmm. And the way that I think we can get it right is to have the, the federal dollars, state dollars, philanthropic <laughs> capital, and partners and communities together looking at what it means and, and kind of at a macro level doing what we started this conversation talking about was the integrated or blended finance model that AWBI tested on an individual entrepreneur level, taking those same concepts and, and looking at the entire financial system. And I mean, there, there's the American banker came out about CDFIs. So it wow. is a time that, that we are coming into our own organizations.
But if we don't have the right people at the table talking about how to shape this money and bringing in other types of, of capital, then, then we're just gonna do more of the same. Huh. And this is the time when we should be able to, to, to listen better and create innovative things um, that are really gonna help people. And in particular, people who have, black and brown people, who, who have these generational issues. And I can speak about it because obviously, I'm a white woman from the South. So, in, you know, this is the time that, that we should step forward because we are going to, because we can and because it's going to make a difference um, in the lives of our children, our grandchildren. I mean, and I, I'm so happy that you invited me to be a part of this um, because I know that you work with a lot of private philanthropists and, and foundations and they need to help. Uh, and, and not just with their dollars, but what Latrice said is their social capital too. Right. I think that's, a, I don't know about the two of you, but I know over the, my professional career, this is the first time that I've heard these conversations happening, that people are willing to step up and say, we can't do it the same way anymore. Or that's, so that's encouraging. And particularly with, to your point, Grace, the watershed of, of capital that'll be coming in and, and how we do it differently. Well, I think I could, I think I could stay and talk with both of you all afternoon. And I just so appreciate your time and your insight and just knowledge. And Latrice, I want to circle back and, and hear about the, again, the entrepreneur, her name that, um, so that we can all look it up afterwards, uh, the toy company. What was mm -hmm. her name? I'm Tara Nichelle at uh, Brown Toy Box. Wonderful. Okay. So that way everybody can go Google it. But um, I just want to say thank you. And thank you to all the listeners. We are our next uh, Forging Forward will be Tuesday. Um, I believe it's May 25th. And so we look forward to seeing you again. But just thank you for this conversation. And thank you for your time. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon.